Okay, folks, good morning again. This is Stephen Montagna with Wakasa. So we're going to uh, uh, jump in and get started. Uh, just a little uh, or a few things as we do. I don't know for, for you folks uh, if any of you are new to webinars uh, or new to using GoToWebinar, which is the service that, that we use. Um, first of all, uh, I am logged in as Peter Fiala. Peter is our uh, training and events coordinator. So if, um, if you see that name, it's still me and or John. It's just that's how we logged into the, into the system. Um, if you're new to GoToWebinar, you should see your control panel or your little uh, GoToWebinar control panel in your, uh, on your screen, usually in the, in the top right corner. Uh, you should see that um, you are muted. All of you uh, are automatically muted, but that you have the ability to raise your hand. Uh, so raising your hand and or typing something uh, into the questions pane are two of the ways of getting our attention if you have a question or something has, has come up. So by all means, uh, use those and we'll do our best to monitor that as we go along. Um, and uh, uh, if you have a question and you're on a computer with a microphone or you're on the phone line dialed in through the phone, I should be able to unmute you and, uh, and we should be able to, to hear your question. If we have any problems with that as we do that, again, you can also type a question into the question pane. Um, so uh, I guess, John, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is John Keekaber. I am the lobbyist for the Wisconsin Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I wanna thank Stephen for putting this together, um, basically doing all the work to get this ready. So thanks, Stephen. Uh, as you may know, also this is really this is the first of three webinars that we have scheduled for the coming few weeks um, on legislative advocacy. The next one I just want to mention very briefly is scheduled for Thursday, November 29th at noon. Uh, we'll get into more detail in, during that second webinar uh, on how to track legislation, how to find out exactly what's going on with a particular bill or particular budget item. And then the third will be held on December 7th, a Friday at noon again. And that will be focused specifically on the state budget process and advocacy. Uh, some of what we talk about today will be relevant for, for advocacy around the budget as well, but we'll get into more detail on, uh, at that last webinar on the state budget process. So today we're really, we're talking, as you know, uh, it's really a, going to be a primer on the legislative process and a basic legislative ad advocacy. And we are focused on the state process at this point. I just want to mention very briefly, you know, when you're talking about advocacy, much of, of what we say is relevant for uh, advocacy on issues of federal uh, uh, relevance or even local issues. Uh, but as far as the process goes, and later on when we talk about the state budget in the third webinar, that's the, the obviously the, that's the state level. Um, uh, processes and, and advocacy. The federal uh, system is a whole different beast, um, and we're focused during this series of webinars on the state process and advocacy. Oops. Uh, our agenda for today, just very briefly, we'll review the legislative process, as I said, and then talk about uh, advocacy within those various uh, stages of the legislative process. The first point I want to make, and it's a basic one, but it's very important and really uh, dictates much of what we do, is the fact, simple fact that uh, the legislative process uh, consists of a number of very distinct uh, stages. And each of those stages, as you'll see in, in here today, has its own uh, rules, its their own timelines, and their own set of uh, decision makers. And as you can imagine, all that is very important for targeting your advocacy efforts and, um, and for your overall uh, effectiveness. So that's just the main point I want to stress uh, throughout uh, today's presentation is uh, we need to gain an understanding whenever you're interested in working on an issue uh, um, of what stage you are in uh, because uh, our processes uh, um, are broken down into several very distinct stages. And partly because of that, uh, timing is very critical in advocacy work. Um, first thing you want to do, whether it's uh, 
whether you've got an issue that you want to proactively take to the legislature or you're responding to something you've heard about in the press or you know that uh, you've heard that there's a bill out there that you may be interested in, um, you first want to ascertain, okay, what at what stage of the process are we in? And we'll get to each of those a little bit later on, but I just want to stress that that's, really, that's always the first first question we ask ourselves. Where exactly are we in the session? What exactly is going on? We have to identify that and, and really define that before we do anything else. As you may know, we have a two-year legislative session here in Wisconsin. For instance, uh, we're currently still in the 2012, to, uh, or rather 2011-2012 legislative session, but it's not the case, uh, as most of you probably know, that uh, that the legislature legislators are active during that whole two-year process and considering bills and so on. Um, but you'll hear us talk about the two-year legislative session. That's what we're referring to. Obviously, the next legislative session will begin in early January, I believe January 7th. Uh, and that legislative session will go for the next two years, then 2013-2014. Uh, because of that, and because because there are such distinct stages, um, when you miss something, whether it's a public hearing or a, um, a briefing by a state agency during the state budget process, whatever it might be, uh, you know we we've missed it. Uh, there's really no going back. Um, uh, that's just to say that ascertaining again exactly where we stand and in the process is, is just critical. This slide is just an indication. As I said, we have two-year legislative sessions in Wisconsin, but they're not all, legislators aren't always voting on measures. They're not always considering things uh, as, as, as committees. Um, it's really broken down into uh, uh, many uh, stages. And, and throughout that two-year period, um, there are breaks and there are sessions when they're actually on the floor and so on. And this is just the calendar for uh, the current legislative session. And as you can see on there, I know it's small print, but uh, it's just to show you there are really there are distinct periods when uh, what are called floor periods where folk where legislators are on the floor voting on measures or, or potentially uh, the assembly and the Senate are, are meeting to vote on on bills. Uh, and also, as you can see, and what I want to point out is, while we have what we call two-year legislative sessions, they're not active that whole time. As you can see, uh, for this current session, uh, legislative work was really wrapped up uh, last March. If you look to this slide and you see last general uh, floor period, it was March 6th to the 15th of 2012. So really, we have legislative sessions that are about 15 months long or so. Now, the legislature can always call itself back into uh, or a special session can be called or an extraordinary session can be called. But generally speaking, if you're interested in advocating on a legislative matter, um, it's that 15 month or so period when they're going to be active. And this next slide is, is just another uh, uh, graphic representation of that legislative calendar uh, periods when they're, again, on the floor or potentially on the floor voting on measures, uh, times when they're not. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, no activity is going on, obviously, when they're not technically on the floor or during a floor period. That's, uh, for instance, when a lot of committee work takes place. But we'll talk about each of those stages in a moment. Now we'll turn to the actual stages that we're referring to. And again, uh, don't think budget at this point. We'll be discussing that at a, on a later webinar. Just This is just a, a representation of the uh, typical process for, uh, for legislation, you know, how a bill becomes a law. Um, and we'll talk about each of these steps in a moment. Uh, but as you can see, uh, bills are drafted, co-sponsors are gained. That's all right, Stephen. <laughs> Bills are introduced. They're assigned to a committee. Typically, public hearings are held. The committees then ho 
hold what's called an executive session where they vote on uh, particular uh, proposals on bills. Each then uh, then that that house uh, has a vote, and then it goes to the governor. Um, now we'll talk about each of these steps in a little bit more detail. Sometimes when you hear about a legislative proposal, or especially if you if it's at the point where you're reading about it in the newspaper, you know it's probably quite a ways along in the, in the process. Um, you know, it might be a bill that's already been drafted and introduced, and then it garners uh, gains attention of folks. But um, if there's something that you want to that you're interested in working on, you know, proactively, um, you can get involved uh, at a very early part in the process, including during uh, uh, bill drafting. Um, Legislative offices uh, often will uh, work with organizations or individuals uh, if it's a proposal they've that person or group has brought forward, or if some an individual or an organization is known as being particularly expert on an issue, uh, legislators may often um, uh, go to will often go to them for their comments on a particular bill draft. Uh, so while that often doesn't gain um, the media attention yet, typically, uh, it's occasionally a place where you can be active as an advocate. Um, really, this this is really once you've established relationships, typically, and, and, and you or your organization is known as a, a trusted source of, of information on a topic. Or again, like I said, if it's something that you have proactively brought forward to a legislator seeking a bill to be drafted. Um, but it's it's an important part of the process because uh, uh, I've certainly seen many times where bills have been drafted, um, and perhaps there have been mistakes in the drafting. Perhaps uh, uh, there was something um, uh, not necessarily a mis drafting mistake, but something that was included in in the language that uh, was has some unintended consequences. You know that folks haven't uh, obviously thought of. Uh, it might not be um, uh, supportive of. So uh, I know from our angle, our end here at Wakasa, you know, we always are looking to be involved and have input as as early in the process as possible. Again, if it's a bill that you're interested in and trying to move proactively, you really want to make sure that what gets what's drafted is exactly uh, what you're interested in and and what will have the consequences that are intended. Part of this process, then, once a bill is drafted, is that co-sponsors are uh, uh, sign on to on to uh, sign on to bills. That can be a pretty that can be an important step. Uh, you will often see a handful of co-sponsors. Sometimes you see bills with long lists of co-sponsors. I know I was I worked on a bill last session where we had forty two co-sponsors, and the fact that that was such an extensive list. Uh, and depending on who is on that list of co-sponsors, that can influence other legislators. That's a bit of an indication to them of level of support, how much something has been vetted, and so on. So if you're involved in a, a bill from an early, the early stages, uh, you can be active in, uh, for instance, if it's something you support, uh, trying to get other offices uh, you know, recommending to them that they sign on as co-sponsors, that kind of thing. That can be that can be pretty powerful. Not isn't always determinative of final outcome, of course, uh, but it's just one more sort of tool that you have as an advocate, and one more sort of step to keep in mind. Now, as this is happening, uh, once co-sponsors are are had, uh, bills are assigned to committees. This is also pretty a pretty critical step. It's not always a given. Um, which committee uh, a particular bill will, will go to. You might have something in the, for instance, again, in our area of work here, the criminal justice related, but it might be something that could go to the uh, a committee that works on public safety, perhaps uh, that's a concern with the judiciary, maybe a separate you know, criminal justice committee. There, are, there typically are couple of different options for bills, at least. And um, it can be important where that bill where that bill goes. 
if you if the bill has a lot of support, if it has a uh, um, champions in the majority party, for instance, uh, probably is going to go to a, a a committee where um, uh, folks are all right with it moving along and, and getting a public hearing and so on. Um, but again, you just want to keep in mind what I want to stress at this point is just to keep in mind these various steps. And the fact that a lot of thinking does go into each of these steps as far as which committee is it going to and why and who is a co-sponsor and who isn't and, and all of that. These are just things to keep in mind and to, if possible, and if you're involved at this early stage, you know, to weigh in on. Uh, the public hearings, uh, which typically occur for bills, uh, not always. There are times uh, when that's not done. And certainly, I want to also stress that even when a bill has been drafted and, and introduced, it's not a given that each of these following stages ever occurs. In many bills, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, die in committee, for instance, um, don't really move along the process, whether because they don't have much support or um, perhaps it's in a committee where uh, that, that committee itself uh, might not be very supportive or might, they might be worried about the bill for some reason. Even if there's other you know, legislative support from others, it might not move forward. But if a bill is uh, moving along in the process, the public hearing is what will happen next. And this, of course, is a, one of the more obvious opportunities for advocacy. It's one of the more and one of the few sort of public, obviously, public opportunities to make a statement on a bill. Um, but I do want to I do want to suggest that by the time a bill has gotten to the public hearing stage, uh, a lot of work should typically have been done already. The public hearing should not be viewed as the sole or even, frankly, most important advocacy opportunity here, uh, you know, in the legislative process. Now, I don't want to um, suggest they're not valuable. I'm certainly not suggesting they're not valuable and, and, and important to take part in, but they're really just one of the stages that you need to be aware of and as an effective advocate need to be involved in. Uh, having said that, um, they are an excellent opportunity. Uh, you might be, you know, it's uh, where there's a public showing of um, uh, you know, people's personal stories, perhaps. Uh, uh, if it's something um, we're working on here at Wakasa, it might be something where we're uh, a bill that we're able to bring in some expert testimony on, uh, whether it's, uh, I know in the past, uh, whether it's a forensic nurse, for example, or uh, in sexual assault services, you know, advocate uh, to talk about a measure and talk about the impacts of that bill. So they are a very useful uh, stage. You can also often get the media interested in an issue once it's got you know, the bill has gotten a public hearing. I certainly have worked on issues where uh, it's been difficult to uh, get the media interested, you know, before this stage. If they don't think it's really moving forward, they're less likely to spend their time, uh, you know, writing about it or uh, 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 getting footage for the evening news. Um, it's another. It's also a time to show the support that already ex that you've already been able to gather for a bill. For example, if other you know uh, to get other organizations to come and testify, other individuals. Um, it's a it's an opportunity to show really the work that hopefully has been done already. Um, you you typically would hope that going into a public hearing, there aren't a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, you know, you want to try to get an understanding of that ahead of time. Hopefully you've thought through or been able to talk to groups who may oppose a, a bill you're interested in. Um, you want to gain as much of an understanding of what that possible opposition is uh, ahead of time and try to shape that public hearing as a real opportunity, as I said, to show the support that exists for that. And really is, a, is an opportunity to show legislators why they should uh, keep moving forward on that particular uh, bill. Once a committee, the, after a public hearing is held, 
Sometimes it's done on the same day, but typically afterwards, that, that committee will then hold an ex- what's called an executive session on that bill. That's simply when they vote on the measure. They don't typically take any public testimony at that time. They're voting themselves as a committee on whether or not the bill is going to be sent to the full house. So if it's an assembly committee, they'll vote. And if it passes that committee, uh, you know, a majority of committee members vote for it, it'll move on to the full assembly in that case. Uh, same on the, on the Senate side, of course. Uh, once it's moved on to that, to that, to that stage, you really want to be getting a sense of where does this stand, you know, for the for that house as a whole. Do you have the votes that are necessary? Now, committees are given uh, typically are given quite a bit of deference. Um, if a committee has worked on an especially thorny issue or a technical one, and it's you know worked out the um, very you know specific issues surrounding uh, that bill. Perhaps it's been a, the bill has been amended in committee to answer some questions or to, you know, improve the legislation in some way. Um, legislators will typically, you know, uh, not want to debate every single bill in full on the floor of that full house. You know, com- committees will be given some deference there, but as as we see, uh, they do debate bills uh, uh, in full houses. Um, and so you're certainly not done and certainly can't rest assured once a bill has passed committee that it's necessarily going to uh, become law at that point. Uh, though you're uh, generally, you've, if it's passed committee, you've got, you've got quite a bit of support clearly already. At that point, then you can also start gaining an understanding of, you know, as I said, where where your votes are in the in the full house, and you can uh, contact legislators and and take a take a roll call, as it's called, of where folks stand, and and typically gain a pretty good understanding of of where they stand um, on a particular measure. You know, a lot of times you you, you may not get a, an answer on exactly how someone is going to vote on the floor. But you can you can by making that communication and simply asking, uh, you you can typically gain a pretty good understanding of of how much support a measure has or not. During those full house uh, sessions, then those floor periods, where for example in the assembly they're taking up a measure, uh, going to debate it and uh, and perhaps vote on it. Uh, that's a key opportunity, not for you to make a public statement, of course, but for you to provide support and key information to those who do support the bill. So that might be a matter of making sure uh, key legislators have your talking points and know, and this is quite important, actually, know what some of the questions may be that other legislators pose, things like that. Um and it's also a time where you can uh, try to make sure that those who do support your bill, or whatever what the bill that you're interested in, um, you know, you can urge them to to uh, speak up if necessary on the floor, and uh, in support of your measure. Now, as we go through this, obviously we're assuming things have have succeeded at each stage, and the bill is moving along. Um, and then it obviously comes down to the governor. But one thing I, I say to folks a lot, and I try to remember myself, is during your advocacy work, as bills move along throughout this process, committee to you know, full house, all of that, it's a common mistake to uh, forget about uh, the executive um, and uh, wait until after the legislature has voted on a bill, uh, until uh, groups contact the governor's office and, and ask about, you know, try to measure their support. Um, it's a very important uh, part of at legislative advocacy to, to be engaged with the governor's office at a much earlier stage in the process. Um, it is just really is a critical matter. Um, you're not always, again, going to get an answer to the question, Do you would you support this or not support this? 
but you have the discussion and you might hear questions that, you know, questions might be raised. Um, other issues might, uh, be spoken about that kind of tip you off to where they might, where the governor might stand. Um, and just, and also where others might stand who have perhaps already contacted the governor on the issue as well. You know, you, you always want to be looking for, uh, what those opposing questions or viewpoints are. Very little legislation is sort of sneaks through, you know, you, you really can't be hopeful to, um, uh, fly under the radar, I guess, on public policy. It's, it's for the most part, not how it works. And engaging those who might be opposed uh, to a particular measure, while always a strategic decision, you generally want to be, be aware that you're going to have to do that because legislators and executives are going to hear from a variety of uh, viewpoints. And if you are honest about what those other viewpoints might be and try to answer those questions as early in the process as possible, the better off you'll be. It also can help at times if you've got an executive, uh, got a governor who's supportive of a particular measure, um, that can actually help with the, the legislative advocacy as well. This is obviously more true when there are good relationships between legislators and the governor's office, something that differs, you know, from session to session, frankly. Um, but if they're pretty much on the same page about a variety of things, um, you can have times where our governor being on board and, and uh, whether they're willing to publicly voice that support yet or not, uh, it can be helpful in your legislative advocacy. We're going to move now to uh, legislative advocacy tips themselves. I don't think we have any questions yet. Is that right, Stephen? But folks should feel free to um, chime in with questions at any time. And as Stephen said, we'll take those as they come uh, or uh, after each section here at least. When it comes to legislative advocacy, one thing I talk to folks about a lot is how they view themselves in the process. And that might sound a little silly, but um, I have seen over the years that how someone or an organization views themselves in the process itself and the role that they, that they see themselves playing in the process uh, will dictate quite a bit their actions and, or in the end, their effectiveness as an advocate. And what I mean by that is, when organizations or, or an individual sees themselves as an integral part of the process, in other words, uh, and I guess we're getting back to sort of for government, you know, or for people, by the people kind of stuff here. Um, when individuals or organizations see themselves as, as a necessary and integral and important part of the government and uh, policymaking process, that will really dictate uh, their actions. And over time, it will be much more effective. Now, as compared to what, uh, some people say. Well, as compared to seeing themselves or yourselves as outside the process, but then occasionally hoping to kind of step in and influence that process. Uh, that's a different sort of approach. That's a different approach. And, and over time, it will not be as effective uh, as an advocacy approach. Um, but I'll get into, the, into more of that in a minute. But I want to urge you to think of yourself as an integral part of the process, to think of the relationships and your, to think of your communications and interactions with policymakers as part of developing long-term relationships. Um, we'll talk about the need to actually communicate. There are always examples of, of uh, even organizations that may have a lot of capacity but then fail to turn that into actual communications. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about advocacy. We're not talking about simply being wise about the process or being smart about a, about a particular measure. Advocacy is about communicating. It's about communicating with decision makers and trying to influence the decisions that are made. And persistence. And we'll get to each of these. In a... Just because I... 
talk okay. about what you want to talk Thanks, about. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Um, and I, I went into this a little bit already. Um, but it, it is true. Like, as I said before, uh, generally speaking, policy does not sort of fly under the radar totally or is, isn't done in private. Um, groups and individuals will be out there trying to influence legislation. Uh, everyone has a right to do that. And for many people and many organizations, you have a responsibility. You know, if you're if you're running or with an organization whose mission is to, uh, I don't know, whether it's to work on housing issues or whatever it might be, uh, you know, you I would suggest you've got a responsibility. Now, obviously, we get into capacity and 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 uh, staffing and all of that kind of thing, but. Everyone has a right to influence the decisions that are made by government. And you can be sure that others are trying to do so. My point is that you might as well uh, join that. When it comes to building relationships with, uh, with policymakers, people try to do this in all sorts of ways, right? And we, we see this occur and we, we hear about some extreme cases. And I will be the last one to suggest, for instance, that like that money doesn't play a role in so our electoral uh, processes here in Wisconsin as elsewhere, and that that doesn't have any impact on policymaking. And you just hear in the news all sorts of ways, right, that people are trying to build relationships. Well, the fact is, relationships are built in a, in a very... Uh, very many ways and uh, similar to any relationship you're going to have with another human being. Um, I describe these always as, you know, you're trying to build long-term relationships, not necessarily monog monogamous <laughs> ones because you need, you want to, you want to reach out to lots of folks, but uh, you know, relationships are about trust. And the only way you develop that uh, is over time and through repeated contact and communications um, just like any kind of human interaction. Um, and so, for example, in the slide, you know, reaching out to legislators uh, consistently. If you haven't been in touch with your legislator in a while, you know, if you're with an organization, invite them out to, to your facility, depending on what you do. Um, go in for a meeting just to touch base, talk about what you're up to, things like that. Uh, instead of, again, just going back to them when you want something or when you're kind of desperate to impact a particular bill that you think is, is critical, you'll be much more effective in your advocacy on those things if you've tried to build relationships kind of, you know, continuously and consistently. And if you do that, you'll see, and we see this all the time, uh, if you make an effort to consistently connect with policymakers and you develop those relationships, you will become a source of information and an ex, uh, you know, source of expertise on a, a particular issue or set of issues for them. You know, that is a role, that is a very important role for advocates is that, you know, these are two-way two -way relationships here and um, a very important role for advocates, whether an individual or an, ex, or an organization, is to be a trusted source of information and to help policymakers make good decisions. It's not just the other way where you're trying to uh, influence something that's done or get, get something uh, done at a single point in time. But once you've established relationships and, and policymakers turn to you, which will happen, uh, some people find that hard to believe, but it will happen over time, um, you will be contacted for your opinion on issues and you'll you'll know at that point that you're you're reaching a level of effectiveness you know uh, uh, that's pretty good uh, pretty strong and it's not just with uh, legislators and the staff the media it's the same way you know if you've been active on an issue or set of issues for some time uh, you'll start you'll start getting the calls instead of needing to try to get stories placed in the paper or get your input into the media stories, they'll start turning to you. Now, communications, that's what I said this is really all about. And I really, I stress this because I've just seen so many examples uh, over the last uh, 12 or so years of groups not doing this. 
Now, obviously, there are times strategically when you decide what to say and to whom and, and how much. Um, but if you're not communicating in the end, you know, we say it in the capital, if you're not in the room and you're not communicating, you're not going to be effective. Um, I find that folks who work on issues where they're very passionate about those issues and they work very hard on them and perhaps they've become quite expert on them, there's a tendency to make a lot of assumptions then about how everybody knows about this particular, you know, particularly a very important issue or development, make assumptions about other people caring to, to the degree you care. And, um, and those assumptions are often wrong. Um, at least in the sense that uh, legislators and staff and other policymakers, you know, agency personnel and others, um, they have a lot coming in front of them. They have a lot of people coming in front of them uh, kind of continuously. If you're not there having those communications as well, chances are the issue is not really on their mind or it will, it will be difficult uh, once the vote comes to them for them to just all of a sudden, you know, learn everything they need to learn. Uh, you need to communicate and you need to communicate consistently. Now, I get the question a lot, well, how to communicate? You know, what's the best form of communication? Is, you know, is email any good? Or often we see during policy campaigns, you know, pre-printed postcards, you know, groups suggest send this into your legislator and, you know, versus a uh, uh, written letter and I think my opinions have changed over the years, probably. I'm still a big believer in letters, and I've had a lot of legislators say to groups, you know, that's probably more likely to come in front of me and to land on my desk. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact is, uh, offices track communications, with, especially with constituents, on issues. And if email is what you can do, you should do it. But the main point I want to make is you shouldn't refrain from communicating just because you think, you know, I don't have time for a visit, I don't face to face, or I don't have time, or I'm not able to get him on the phone. Don't let that stop you from communicating. Do something. Now, what I like to, what we typically do, and, and what I typically recommend is, is doing more than one thing. You know, if you have uh, had a visit with a legislator or a staff person, whether in the district or here in Madison, uh, or whether you've written a, or had a phone call, a phone conversation, follow that up with a letter or, you know, follow that up with an email. It's another chance to, it's a chance to re reiterate, you know, some main points. It's a chance to provide information that may have been asked about in that first communication. But again, you want to establish regular communications. And so you should think of the various uh, ways you can communicate as simply as different tools, you know, that you have at your disposal. Over time, people get will get more comfortable. Now, I don't know ex your experience level, but um, it's always uh, folks are often a little wary. You know, they have a sit down with a legislator or staff, or uh, talk to someone on the phone. This is the kind of work that you, like most things, you just get more comfortable with the more you do it, and you start to see how folks want to hear from you, and legislators typically want to hear from their constituents. Um, so the more you do, the more comfortable uh, you'll get as well. And that's important if you're for your own communications, but also if you're at an organization where you're trying to turn other people out, you know, doing grassroots ad, uh, advocacy work, getting members of the public to make a communication about something. You always want to stress, you know, do what you can, do, do something, um, and then try to help them do something a little bit more, you know, because they'll get more comfortable over time as well. And the fact is, many pieces of legislation take more than one session or more than one year to get passed. Um, I've worked on a number of issues over the years where it, it's taken certainly taken more than one legislative session for, for a bill to get passed. Now, obviously, procedurally, it's got to be reintroduced and go through that whole process we talked about earlier. But it's definitely true, and I'm not sure that it's a, that it's a bad thing. It's probably a good thing that you often have to go through a process of educating uh, policymakers on an issue, um, educating the public as well. You know, if it's an issue that the media then writes about, uh, people may have a lot of questions about it. I mean, that's our process. Uh, you've just got to be persistent. It is very common for 
bills to take more than one legislative session and become law. Some uh, I've seen take four or five sessions, frankly. Um, it might take that long for, well, you might have turnover, obviously, in the legislature, and there might be uh, folks who come in who are more friendly to the issue, frankly, but uh, it also might be um, one that has to percolate a bit and uh, for the comfort level to get to get to the point where people are willing to vote for it. So just to go back very briefly, um, always know where in the process you are or a particular measure is. You know, is this a budget? First of all, is this a budget issue? Is this a regular legislative? Okay, it's a regular legislative bill. Well, where do we stand? Is it a public hearing that I'm reading about in the newspaper? Okay, well, that's where we are. Then understanding the various stages, you know now what's gone into it already and you know sort of what's coming next. So you can target your advocacy based on that. You know, are we very early? Are legislators sort of thinking about an issue? Um, that allows you many more opportunities to get in there. And as we said earlier, you know, with all those various stages of drafting of the bill and gaining co-sponsors and committee assignment, all of that you can weigh in on. But knowing where you are in the process um, is just critical. It's just, you've just got to do it. Uh, that also will help you recognize who the key decision makers are for that particular bill. Again, once it goes to committee or once, you know, you know who the, the authors and the co-sponsors are. Um, but it might be that a committee is going to be very key. Uh, and so then that lets you target your advocacy to those five, seven, nine members, whatever it might be. Nobody has time to con run around contacting 132 legislators. Uh, I'm not sure that you want to, even if you had the time. But you, once you recognize who the key decision makers are, uh, you can move forward then in an, in an informed way. And then don't forget to actually make the ask and to make the communications. Uh, that's where the influence comes. It's very important to understand the process. It's very important to understand the issue itself. But if you don't communicate your needs and your opinions, your questions, whatever it is, uh, well, that's just not, yeah, it's not advocacy. You're not going to really have an influence on that particular measure. Now, I'm not getting into the specifics now of who's the best messenger with whom and all of that kind of thing. Those are all strategic decisions that you can think about and get better at over time. Uh, but for today's session, uh, I just want to stress, don't forget to actually communicate your ask and your needs uh, with policymakers and to then be persistent um, over time. Policy generally can take quite a while uh, before it becomes law. This is my contact information. Um, Obviously, us uh, uh, we here at Wakasa are always available. Our policy team is available uh, to talk about issues you might be interested in. Um, our next webinar will deal with sort of keeping track of the things we've talked about. You know, how do you find out and how do you keep track of legislation? Where does it stand? That kind of thing. But people often don't have time to, you know, we'll, we'll, so that we second webinar will focus on that and we'll give you some tips for keeping track of legislation and uh, bill drafts and so on, um, which should help. But you should always feel free to contact me as Wakasa's lobbyist or others here at Wakasa uh, with those questions too. You may have just read about something in the paper that legislators are interested in you know, feel free to call us and, and ask us where that stands. You know, we can help cut through the process a little bit for you. So I just want to go back and mention the next two to next two webinars. The second one, again, Thursday, November 29th at 12 o'clock, will be focused on uh, how to track what's happening with legislation again, as I just said. We'll have some resources and links available on frankly, pretty pretty efficient ways, pretty easy ways to keep track of of legislative developments uh, that are that are no cost. There certainly are uh, tools out there that you can pay for 
I, I frankly find them unnecessary. Um, there are a lot of free uh, options for keeping track of, of legislation. And then the third webinar, which will be on the biennial budget process, will be on Friday, December 7th at noon. Now, I think at, I don't believe we've gotten any questions. Yeah. Um, so we will just sign off at this point. Well, uh, or, uh, but Stephen, go, maybe, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. I was going to say just maybe hold to see if there are, are any questions. Uh, again, you can can raise your hand and or type uh, type something in the um, uh, in the uh, text area in the text question area. I was just going to say just to reflect back. It was interesting, John. You know, because when we talk about having these conversations, it, we've talked in the policy team about the overlap and the connection with prevention work because that's the hat that I wear predominantly in the, in the agency. I, I can't help but thinking or drawing that connection where we're talking about having these difficult, both having the difficult conversations, i.e. you will interact with the legislator that you know, you know, going into it may have a, a dissenting opinion or maybe not as educated on these issues. And, and just allowing yourself to be in that space, we always use the phrase of meet them where they're at, right? Sure. Uh, uh, and just the, the more you do prevention work, I think there's an analogy there as an agency to also being prepared for doing advocacy work at the policy level, because it is very similar in terms of having those 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 conversations. And also similarly, what you said about always being about being a, a more active part of the process, not just going in when there's a particular issue. Again, we all we too often think from an advocacy and intervention perspective of this has happened, we'll react. Uh, and when we're talking about prevention work, the idea of shifting the overall atmosphere, having that conversation being ongoing so that you're not just speaking up when someone says something that's offensive, you're actually constantly trying to put that positive language out there and create that that cultural shift. Yeah, those are good points. And to the latter point, you know, and that's really a reflection of how the process really works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we laid out here the specific s stages that exist and then, you know, what happens at each, um, that's a little bit of an indication of how it's more of a continuous or a longer process than simply that point, one point in time when they're going to vote on something. Mm -hmm. But really, if you think about what policymaking is from idea to enactment of law, and frankly, beyond that, mm -hmm. you know, implementation and then reaction to law and what the influence of a law, new law has been, mm -hmm. it is a continuous process. So if you, if, if you recognize that, I think that helps that helps folks understand then the need to continuously be sort of part of the process and engaged. Um, and briefly to your first point, yeah, I mean we all have t times when we're going into a meeting where you know, and, and there are times when you just know the person you're going to be speaking to is is either opposed to a particular bill that you're that you're uh, in favor of, or maybe you you think they're um, uh, opposed to a general idea that or notion that you want to raise, you know, whatever it might be. That, that's certainly true. But I, I have found this. Um, it is appreciated by policy, you know, by legislators and staff, agency personnel, whoever it is, that you're there anyway, you know. Uh, and well, I, I guess I'd say a couple of things. First of all, you don't want to make too many assumptions there. Uh, you don't want to assume, I mean, sometimes you will just know, okay, this person has voted against this bill three times, whatever, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you don't want to assume too much and you don't want to assume, well, I don't think this person, this person is going to be difficult to talk to. People are always making mistakes along those lines and you never know. I mean, so you might learn something when you go in and have a conversation with somebody, you know, you might learn something about their own personal experience or, uh, about their life, uh, that might have them in a different position than what you assume they would be. Mm -hmm. um, you just don't know. But even when it's the case where, yeah, they, they're opposed and they're going to oppose something. First of all, there are strategic reasons to still go in mm -hmm. um, often, uh, but it's appreciated, you know, uh, and th that will be remembered that you've gone in and you've, you've laid out your points and you've been respect in a respectful way, in a professional way. Um, Again, just thinking of these as relationships, uh, there's really ra rarely, if ever, a time when you shouldn't be respectful. Um, you lay that out, and you and you have that discussion. Uh, it's really it's really for the best, and uh, 
long term, it's going to help you. It's, it really is. So at this point, if uh, if there are no other questions, I don't I don't see any hands raised, um, and it doesn't look like anyone's typed anything, uh, and and that's okay. Certainly, as John mentioned, you have his contact information, and of course, you're also welcome to contact Wakasa. Um, we we thank you for your participation. Uh, if there have been any issues technically, any technical difficulties, or anything you'd like to let us know about your experience on this webinar, please contact uh, contact me. Uh, I'm going to see if I can, uh, real quick, whoops, nope, it's not going to auto-complete. Uh, let's just see, I'll put it up this way. Um, this is my email, uh, dot or, whoops, org, oops, not going to, yeah, it doesn't want to do that. Well, I was going to try to make it larger, but you can sort of see it there. Uh, Stephen M. at wakasa.org. And um, uh, otherwise, uh, this concludes this webinar. We look forward to, to seeing you on future podcasts, webinars, the uh, other two po uh, policy sessions that John mentioned. Uh, have a great day.